looked at the first two laws, again, the first law, sometimes it's known as the law of inertia, that matter will stay at rest or stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. Okay, and then the second law is that force that's required to move any object is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And we measure that in newtons. Okay, and then the third law. Let's take a look at law number three. Newton's third law of motion states this action-reaction principle. So for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So it states this principle. Okay, for, here's the law stated, for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So when we have a uh, something that is moved in one direction, there's something that's moving in the opposite direction that's equal to it. So you've probably seen that when, for instance, if you're on a boat and you jump off a boat, let's say you jump out of a canoe or you jump out of a rowboat, and as you jump out into the water, the boat pushes behind you, right? The boat pushes out from underneath you. Or as you fall into a swimming pool, let's uh, say you're standing right on the edge, and you just lean over toward the pool, keeping your body straight, and you just fall into the pool, kind of like a board. Well, what happens? Your, your body hits... And then where's the opposite reaction that's equal? Well, that water that is that's thrown back behind you, that big splash, that's a reaction. That's a reaction to the energy, the action that you pushed into the water. Okay, so that's kind of a, a simple way of stating it, but it's a, it's a common way of doing it. So... Uh, there is a opposite and equal reaction for every action, and uh, you know when we when we uh, look at uh, a falling object, okay, and we're thinking about its uh, uh, distance and its acceleration, you know we we always have on a falling object. Uh, if it's coming through the air, if a skydiver, you know, jumps out of a plane, this person is a falling object, and the person experiences drag, which is really what? The, the friction, right? There's an experience of drag, and that's air resistance, air friction. And it's going to slow you down at some point, right? So where does it slow you down? Well, the, where it finally slows you so that you don't keep accelerating, you have what they call terminal velocity. Uh, the terminal velocity, that means the end velocity, it's not going to go any faster. It's the greatest velocity an object achieves uh, when uh, falling, okay? So it's the greatest velocity that it's achieved in a fall. It can't go faster than this particular velocity. So let's think about that for a minute. Let's say you are up here in an airplane and there's the wings and you jump out and the acceleration of gravity says that you're going to fall 9.8 meters per second per second per second squared 9.8 meters per second squared put a little two there not doing that too well put a two there 
Yeah. So that means that the first second, you're going to drop 9.8 meters. So that's 9.8 meters, and that's your first second. The second section, or the second second, you're going to drop the 9.8 meters, but you're also going to do an additional 9.8 because you're accelerating. You're going faster and faster. So this is what happens, your second second. Your third second, you are going to fall the 9.8, the next 9.8, and a third 9.8 in that one section. And you're going to keep in those seconds, the third second, uh, you can see what's going to happen, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. But what's eventually going to happen, you're going to hit the point where the friction of falling through the air, you do not keep accelerating. Now, if you were without the air, without any of this air that you're falling through, so there's no push up from the air, there's no friction, you would just keep adding more and more speed, uh, more and more acceleration as you fall. But you do reach this terminal velocity. And uh, and that's uh, one of the things that really slows you down. And then finally, uh, it just stops you from accelerating any further. Okay. So, um, yeah, so there's a, a law of gravitation. If you turn to page 301, uh, we want to take a look at page 301 now. In your textbook, let's read about this law of universal gravitation. Okay, and so we know that this, the uh, acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second per second. So turn to page 301, and let's take a look at this. Uh, universal law of gravitation. In the example above, we found out that the gravity on Mars is less than it is on Earth. Why is this so? Well, we know that the gravitational forces are directly related to the mass of an object. In fact, only very massive objects such as planets and stars exert enough gravity to be felt. The gravity of the Sun is very strong. The gravity of the Earth is much less. So, uh, so you have a, a center of gravity point, and uh, the, uh, the let, let's just keep reading uh, this next paragraph. We also realize that gravity has a limited range of influence. For example, by the time the spacecraft Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 traveled past Mars, Earth's gravity no longer had any noticeable effect on them. As the distance from an object's center of gravity increases, the influence of its gravity becomes weaker. There are slight differences in gravity, even on the Earth's surface, depending on where you're located. Newton recognized the relationship between gravity as a force, the mass of two objects, and the distance separating those objects. This helped Newton formulate the universal law of gravitation. Okay, So there's his law of gravity. Force is equal to the gravity of the first uh, mass times the second mass divided by the distance squared. There's his universal law of gravity. And so... We uh, know that satellites are held in orbit by the Earth's gravity, and a little satellite that's going around the Earth, and if it keeps up its speed, then the pull of gravity of the Earth will not pull it all the way in and destroy it, but it can keep going around the Earth if it maintains that speed. And so... We can see that uh, Kepler, I'd like you to reread pages 
304 and 305 and make sure that you understand the significance of Johannes Kepler. And Johannes Kepler, very important, um, has three laws of planetary motion. And so this is important to know that he's the author of those three laws of planetary motion. So I'd like you to read that. And uh, you do not have to have that memorized. You don't have to be able to recite his three laws. But I'd like you to read it and kind of understand what was he saying with those three laws of motion. Now, one of the things that we're going to begin in our study is a, is a study of machines. And machines are really anything that help do work. They help do work. So we know that. We, put, we have a washing machine. We've got a toaster. We've got different machines that do work, okay? And so work is defined as a change in position. Something has to change position. So if I move a table from one side of the room to another, I've done some work. Okay. And the other thing is that work has to do with an applied force. I have to apply force to make something change position. If if there's no force applied, then there's no work done. So it's an applied force. Now, uh, so work uh, is really a change in position, and we also realize that we have a force involved. So remember what force is. It's the mass times the acceleration. Okay, and so you can push, uh, you know, against a wall, you can push against a tree, and you can push and push and push, you can put a lot of force on it, but if there's no movement, work is not done. So you've got to have, uh, see if there's no movement, you could be putting lots of force on it, but there's still no work. So the work is really defined and, and try to get that in your mind that you do work when something moves after an applied force is set on it. And so let's give uh, an equation now for work. Okay, Work is going to be equal to that force times the distance that it's moved. Okay, It's the force times the distance. And force... Uh, you know, of course, is, uh, you know, the amount of effort. You could talk about that being effort. But uh, this uh, uh, work is measured in newtons. So newtons is the unit that we use, capital N, for work, okay? So we have to displace something, and it has to move. So, on page 311, we see an example at the top of the page. I think this is a real good one. Calculating the amount of work done in, neuter, in uh, newtons, which is your force, times meters. So, if you push an empty cooler on the surface of a picnic table with a 20 newton force for a distance of 2 meters, how much work is accomplished? And I think it's always good to uh, draw a picture. So here's your table. That's a picnic table because we're dealing with a picnic uh, uh, thermos type thing. Empty cooler. So here's our table. And we've got this cooler on the top. It's empty. And so we're going to push the cooler with a force of 20 newtons. I just like to calculate it out, and it's going to be moved a distance of 
two meters. Okay, so we're moving this two meters. So my equation, the work done, is equal to the force times the distance moved. The force is 20 newtons times two meters. So I'm going to be, uh, the work done is 40 newton meters. Okay, so work is done as, you know, in a way, by knowing this equation, you'll never get wrong what work is. Work is always moving something and by means of a force. So the actual equation gives you those components. Work has to have a force. If there's no force, there'd be a zero. Zero times the distance, no work. Or if it, it's not moved, if you're just pushing on it like a tree with a lot of newtons, it's you might have 60 newtons push, but no distance, so it's 60 times zero is zero. There's no work done. So work is always done in uh, the light of a newton meter. So remember, force times the distance, okay? Now we've got lots of simple machines that uh, some of you have studied before and um, we have uh, a very simple machine is a lever okay and uh, so we're going to be talking about some of these machines that help us do work that means that help us move things okay there's a machine that, that there's actually movement and levers are used. So the first type of lever is called a first degree lever. And a lever always has um, a fulcrum, which is this fixed point. That's the fulcrum. So I'm going to spell that out. The fulcrum is the pivot point. Sometimes it's called the pivot. Okay. So, and you can tell this is a uh, teeter-totter. So if I put a 40-pound uh, bag on this side and I put a 40-pound bag on this side, if this distance from the fulcrum to the bag is the same as this distance from the fulcrum to the bag, in other words, if distance 1 is the same as distance 2, and the two weights are the same, this should balance. You know, we've done that a whole bunch of times. You've taken a pencil and balanced it on your finger. And you know that roughly, if you have that same distance from the weight to the fulcrum on both sides, on both arms, then you've got it balanced, you know. And so this is called the law of moments, okay? This is the law of moments, and so we're going to give you that law. Uh, it's really the teeter-totter law. You might be thinking uh, about that. So uh, this is the law of moments, and we use it with a teeter-totter. And uh, it's where we place the weight, how far from the fulcrum on each side. So we have... Um, that, that that would be an example of a first class lever. Now a first class lever has the fulcrum in the center. So uh, as we think about that, if we have uh, a resistance uh, side, which is what we're moving, the resistance, uh, and then we have an effort uh, that we're where we put uh, the strength, it's going to have a fulcrum in the middle. So an example of this would be scissors. You know, we could easily see scissors being part of that. So you've got uh, the, the blade of the scissors that cuts paper, got a fulcrum in the middle, which is the middle point, and then you've got your two handles. And so you apply what? effort, you squeeze that, it pivots on the fulcrum, 
and then you've got paper so the resistance is what you're cutting through. There's your resistance. Notice you've got your fulcrum in the middle. That's what uh, you need for a first class lever. Now we're going to also look at a second class lever. A second class lever is uh, a lever that has a resistance and an effort arm to it. Uh, there's some good examples on page 322. So if you turn to page 322 in your book, you'll see some excellent examples. But the second class lever has the resistance in the middle. So the resistance is in the center. So think about that. You've got resistance in the middle. That's the weight or the thing you're moving. And you've got some kind of lever. So therefore the fulcrum is going to be on one end. Okay. And the effort is going to be on the other end with the resistance in the middle. So I think of something very easily seen here would be a wheelbarrow. So for instance, a wheelbarrow, you've got your uh, weight of gravel right here. It's got a wheel down here. There's your fulcrum. That's where you tip. And of course you pick up the effort side of it. So you've got your resistance in the middle, which defines it as a second class lever. You're picking up the uh, the effort on the right side there and then you've got your fulcrum um, or your pivot right down here where the tire is. Now the third type of lever is the third class lever and in the third class lever we have the effort is in the center so that's where we're applying effort Okay, so let's think about that. You've got effort in the center, and therefore on one side you've got resistance, and on the other side you've got a fulcrum. Okay, so, hmm, what would you do to apply effort in the middle so that you've got a pivot on one end, the fulcrum, and you've got resistance on the other? Well, I can kind of see with tweezers. Let's try a tweezer effect. Tweezers have a pivot on the one end. There's the fulcrum, right? And we've got our fingers that compress the tweezers. Our tweezers are compressed. And you've got something that you're picking up. That's the resistance. So what you have to do is just kind of draw yourself a diagram for each one, and I want you to do that. Uh, use each one of the pictures on page 322, and you're going to diagram them out, each one, very neatly. First class, second class, third class. Now I've done three of them for you, so you've got six to go. So I'd like you to diagram that on your paper. and. Really get it straight in your own head where the resistance is, where the pivot or the um, fulcrum, and where the effort is. Let's do uh, one that's, uh, uh, goodness, something that, I'm trying to think of something that we could uh, do that's not shown here. Let's think of a... Um, yeah, let's just think of a of something like a uh, a board that we're using to pry up a uh, something out of the ground. Let's say we have a rock, and we've got this is in the ground, okay, kind of exposed, but this rock, and so we want to push it out of the ground. So we stick a, a big long two by four in the ground. And we're going to put effort this way, right? So the effort is on one end. Now, we've stuck it in the ground, and we need something like a smaller rock right here that would make it pivot. And then, of course, this side, as I push down, 
this side is going to push up and it's going to jet the rock out. So here's the uh, fulcrums in the middle. The resistance is on that end. So what is the type of, uh, of lever where the fulcrum is in the middle? Okay, and oh boy, that's the first class lever, isn't it? First class lever has the fulcrum in the center. So this simple lever, just prying something out of the ground, you're using a lever, and it's a first-class lever. So I'd like you to write those types of levers on a piece of paper. Just uh, label it page 322, and uh, go ahead and, and just uh, uh, set that out on your page, a sketch, make a sketch of each of those objects, and then explain and identify F, E, and R. The fulcrum, the effort, and the R, the resistance for each one. Okay? God bless you, and we will uh, uh, be sending your assignment out as well. Please remember to keep it uh, as you do your homework. Put it in your folder, and this week you will be bringing your folder on May 5th by Hoffmantown. You'll be dropping it off there, and I'll be returning your work that you've turned in. So you'll be picking work up, dropping work off uh, from 9 a.m. to noon on May 5th. That's a Tuesday at Hoffmantown. Thank you. Bye-bye.